Good morning, members. Uh, I'd like to call the Environmental Natural Resources Policy and Finance Committee uh, to order. Today's date is Thursday, April 12th. And uh, before we start, you probably heard my gavel wrapping up here on the table. We're going to have a little ceremony today. We're going to retire that one. And we are now going to be using this gavel. Okay? And there's significance to this. Uh, Representative Tony Albright's father, Denny, um, found some black walnut in an old barn someplace. I don't remember exactly where. And, uh, and uh, Denny Albright has made gavels for every committee wow. here wow. in the right. legislature. So Chair Torkelson, Chair Davids, you weren't around yesterday. You were doing something more important. You were at a Bible study, I heard. Good for you. <laughs> Rain for all of us. You present to win, did you, Mr. Uh, no, they, they will be delivering it to you. But, okay, uh, I just wanted to recognize uh, Representative Albright and his father, Denny, for, uh, for doing this. And they're all created exactly the same. And they're made from regular Minnesota black walnut. So I think they come from southeastern Minnesota somewhere. D Representative Draskowski hasn't gotten all of them yet. <laughs> so I need a motion as to what we should do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Representative Clark Johnson. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a note that I find interesting, uh, many of the oldest structures in south central Minnesota, the studs, were black walnuts. That's, no. oh that's what these are, yes. So, yeah, up in my country, we use tamarack. <laughs> or hackberry. So, <coughs> I'd like the record to show that uh, we're expressing our appreciation to Danny Albright and uh, Representative Albright for their contribution. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the minutes before us. Representative Clark Johnson, I know you've read the minutes uh, thoroughly. Uh, would you care to move the minutes, please? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the minutes from April 11th. Thank you. Uh, those uh, in favor of the minutes as presented for April 11th signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Ooh, that sounds good. The minutes are approved with the new gavel. Okay. So now you can relax. Okay. Okay. She was concerned about what I was going to do with this new gavel. I didn't tell her a thing. <laughs> but someone left caucus early yesterday, too. But no. Okay, next uh, we have Chair Davids here. Uh, uh, House file 3052. Uh, and I will move that we uh, will be laying 3052 over for possible inclusion. Welcome, Chair Davids, and your testifiers. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. House File 3052 is a bill that appropriates $300,000 to uh, work on curriculum for feedlot training. Uh, and I do need to state for the record that uh, I was a bit nervous a couple days ago when the MPCA came up to me and said that they wanted to testify on my bill. And my heart just kind of went, oh. <laughs> again? <laughs> I mean, I have history here. Um, <laughs> uh, that being said, it was Greta Gauthier or Gauthier? Gauthier. Gauthier uh, said she wanted to testify on behalf of my bill. Uh, and I got an uh, email from her this morning saying that uh, she's had another commitment come up so she won't be able to. But I do want to go on the record saying the MPCA does support this bill. Yep. So that's pretty exciting for me. Okay, so with that, uh, I have three testifiers with a very short testimony that uh, would like to go on the record and then uh, certainly we'd stand for questions. Uh, my first testifier is Dan Vermillier with uh, the Steel Jim. County Feedlot. Uh, he's a Steel County Feedlot Officer and the MACFO Legislative Chair. Well, Mr. Chair, I would say to you that uh, being the chair of the powerful House Tax Committee, I can't imagine that MPCA would not support any bill that you bring forward. But that being Point said... Point well taken, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> to your testifier, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Dan Vermalia. I'm the feedlot officer for Steele County and uh, also the legislative uh, chair for the... Uh, MACFO Association was the, which is the Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers. Uh, before we get involved in the bill, I'd just like to, and I know we're pressed for time, but I'd like to just take a couple, three minutes, talk a little bit about the history of how we've come to this point in time. Uh, several years ago, uh, the MACFO Association and PCA formed a <coughs> joint program for training and communications, and the goal of that of that training group was to provide obviously adequate training and, and substantial training, not only to uh, to new county feedlot officers, but existing folks and also PCA staff. 
what we started to notice was uh, about five or six years ago, due, due to some funding cuts and also some staffing cuts at the state level, uh, we were struggling a little bit providing adequate training for people. And so we took a look at some options of what to do. And one of the things we looked at was developing a WebEx program. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, that is an opportunity where an individual can set their workstation, uh, provide the presentation, the rest of us look at it online. Uh, that has worked fairly well. Uh, some of the concerns that we've had with that is uh, we were having very inter very little interaction between the committee members and the uh, and the presenter, and so afterwards we would ask some of these people why they weren't asking questions. And from from a peer pressure standpoint, they just simply said, "I don't want to ask that question in front of everybody else. It would be better if I could do that on a more private or one-on-one -on -one setting." So the next thing we looked at is maybe we should develop a mentorship program. And really, what this is is the opportunity for a new person in a county to work with, uh, with more experienced seasoned people in those neighboring counties. And here again, that system has worked fairly well, but it really depends on the uh, relationship and the association that the counties have with each other. And the other issue that we saw is the amount of staff time that that person might have that would be willing to and available to pr provide uh, uh, training to that new person. During this five or six year time period, one of the things that we really saw is we saw a tremendous amount of turnover happening in the feedlot program. Uh, it was not unusual for us to attend a annual conference and we would have maybe 10, sometimes as many as 15 new people uh, that were new to the feedlot program at that convention. Uh, in a, actually in a three year time period, we had a, over a 50% turnover in, uh, in folks doing the feedlot work. And what we started to hear and get some feedback from the livestock industry is they were telling us things that, you know, we had people out here, regulator people, whether at a county level or state level, that really didn't have a very good or basic understanding of the feedlot program and the 7020 feedlot rules. And so that was a really a concern of ours. And one, the other thing that we were, hearing, we were hearing is that there was some inconsistencies on how those rules were being interpreted across the state. So one of the things that we went to people as they were leaving, we would ask them, you know, why are you leaving? And obviously we'd hear, hear multiple reasons why they were leaving, but there was one thing that was pretty consistent. They really felt that they were very much alone in their job when they were doing it. Uh, there are 50 counties that are involved in the feedlot program in the state of Minnesota. I, I'm only aware of two or three that have more than one county feedlot officer. So if you're hired, you're the new person in there and you basically have to figure out how to run the program. You can't walk across the hall and ask somebody else, you know, I've got this issue, how would you handle it? They, they, there's just not that availability to them. So that's really brought us to the point as we continue to, to struggle and try to figure out how to develop this program, we, uh, we got a hold of the University of Minnesota Extension and Tim here and uh, we talked about how best to do it, which has brought us to the online training program that you see in front of you today. Uh, one of the things that we did talk to people about as they left is if we, would, if we were to develop something like this, would you feel comfortable in that type of a training program? Uh, most of the people that do come into the program are younger people, millennium people, and they are very, very comfortable in this type of media. So we think it's a very valuable resource for us to develop this type of training program. The other thing I think we, we think we see some real value in it, not only for, for regulate, regulatory people to have a very good understanding of the rules and requirements, but we think the livestock industry will benefit from it. And we also think the general public will benefit from having a one source opportunity for people to go look at uh, <coughs> the rules and requirements of 7020 rules. And with that, Mr. Chairman, committee members, that's, uh, I have no further comments. Uh, so, um, Mr. Vermilia, how do you pronounce your last name again? That's close enough, sir. Okay. What other hats do, we talked yesterday about what county officials do, what other hats would a county feedlot officer wear in, in a county? Uh, I mean, would he be the county engineer, or the environmental officer, or what? Um, or is it unique? Most, most of the time, well, I shouldn't say, a majority of them are housed in planning and zoning offices. Uh, if they're not housed there, they're housed in the soil and water offices. 
So they might be involved in planning and zoning issues. They might be involved in, uh, in uh, being an agricultural inspector. Uh, some people do the septic program. Uh, if they're working in soil and water, they're doing other issues too. So they're, they're, all, they're people that are, most of us are all wearing multiple ads. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, members? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Rick Hans, Rep Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, looking at the online training, I think we had a similar bill a few years ago relating to try to put paper training or for the pesticide applicators into online or into digital versions so that we didn't have to keep printing printed manuals because the rules, laws change and trying to keep things adapted. Um, back in 2000, 2001, I had to do the commercial animal waste technician manual, so that's almost 20 years ago now, um, or moving on it. So those were paper manuals. So I'm wondering um, if you've had any coordination with either the university or the Department of Ag on the commercial animal waste technician manuals and training, if there's, if you're doing the online for this, if we can essentially update a couple things with, con there's both content and media. Um, that's one question. And then the second question, I know uh, Representative Davids, when uh, there were commercial animal waste technicians in your district, we actually did uh, training with Iowa, with Howard County and Fillmore County, because there were people moving back and forth across the border. That's a little different than feedlot officers. But uh, wondering about any coordination with content um, with Iowa State uh, as well, or any other uh, entities, if that if that's been, if that's occurred, or if that would be involved as well. Mr. Berman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hanson. Uh, I'm fairly familiar with the CAWT training program. Um, matter of fact, uh, our organization was quite involved in that. Uh, the, there was some new uh, rules and, and manuals that were just redone about two years ago. Uh, we have developed an online training program uh, very similar to what we're talking about for manure applicators in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it is, went over quite well. We still continue due to the educational uh, portion of it. As far as reciprocal work with the state of Iowa, uh, that no longer is being done at this point in time. Okay. okay. Um, next testifier, Chair David. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to bring up a Mike Frauenkrown, who is my a county feedlot officer and zoning officer, uh, to make a few, very few comments. Mr. Frauenkrown. Good Frown morning. Crown. Welcome. Good morning. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm here to talk about, I'm just going to give you a brief statement on what I see the program is going to be about. I'm here to talk to you about House Finance 3052, uh, Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers Online Training Curriculum Development Appropriation. Uh, we're requesting $300,000 to develop these online training modules. Um, there are 50 counties that are delegated to administer Chapter 7020 rules and about 65 staff doing field work, paperwork, and data entry into Tempo, which is a state database. Feedlot officers have been the front line of communicating with and educating livestock farmers of the feedlot rules chapter 7020. This course will allow staff to increase employee retention in the county, feedlot officers position, uh, learn on demand and at their own pace, test their level of comprehension, review information when needed, and dwell deeper into references and research. The goal is to prevent the incidence of manure and or nutrients from entering surface water and groundwater. Our objectives and activities is to develop a detailed online course outline and work plan for feedlot officer training. <clears throat> uh, write feedlot officer curriculum and produce narrated video segments around program administration which includes registration, permitting, compliance, and enforcement. Test pilot curriculum with feedlot officers and MPCA staff um, and incorporate changes for final online courses. The curriculum will be online on demand class. In the future, this curriculum may be adapted to be used by farmers and general public. 
Our timeline will take approximately two years. Uh, Long-term water quality will be preserved and improved through ongoing feedlot site reviews. Project impact and long-term strategy will be achieved by manure and nutrient management plans that meet state standards and are implemented correctly and will continually enhance through reviews of existing and newly constructed feedlot sites. Due to the lack of personnel and open positions in the MPCA feedlot program, Minnesota Association of the County Feedlot Officers believes that it would be beneficial for, this, for the feedlot program to develop these online training modules. New feedlot officers as well as experienced feedlot officers will be able to review modules on registration, permitting, compliance, and enforcement. This will result in all feedlot officers receiving the same information and bring consistency to the feedlot program statewide. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Questions or comments? Members? Thank you for your testimony. Chair Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The last testifier I have, and I don't know if there's others, but the last one, uh, I'm going to bring forward Tim Arlt, the University of Minnesota Extension Service. Good morning, Mr. Arlt. Good Take morning. yourself for the name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Tim Arlt, I'm uh, with the University of Minnesota Extension Center for Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. I'm a program leader within that uh, center and I work with our local uh, county-based faculty most of the time, but I also manage uh, uh, grants for, uh, for the, our ag programs. Um, <clears throat> so we were approached by MACFO to, uh, as Dan said, to kind of help try to develop this online curriculum. And um, they came to us um, partially because of um, what had been done with what is online for the commercial ag waste technician training, um, but also the fact that we have some expertise in, and we have developed online curriculum uh, in the past. And so um, we're looking at uh, trying to do that with MACFO to uh, gather as much input from them as we can. We've started the process of outlining um, the, the course and what would be um, part of each of what we might call chapters. Um, this whole online training uh, has changed very rapidly over the last three years. Um, where we started out three years ago doing some online training has evolved into new systems now where we can um, monitor uh, student progress, we can have testing built in, we can um, have uh, sessions built in that are interactive, and um, it's just, you know, really expanded the possibilities. When you look at older curriculum that it were used, uh, they're more static, uh, use uh, pictures, uh, weren't able to incorporate video as well, um, didn't have all of the bells and whistles, I guess we could say, that new technology does. And so we're looking at, at something that I think would be a, a great training tool. Um, and we're very supportive of trying to work with um, MACFO on this and in trying to develop it for their staff. And eventually, I, I really do see this as being something that uh, farmers could go through and very easily um, understand uh, the rules that they need to operate under. And so uh, having worked in a county as a county educator for 25 years, I really see this as valuable. Um, I see it as, you know, potentially quite valuable for my staff even. And so I am very supportive of this project. Thank you, Mr. Alt. Questions? Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just comment that uh, Mr. Arlt is, I have great confidence in his ability as an extension educator. and. I'm glad that he's involved. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I like the idea that other people can get online and see the stuff so they know what the expectations are and helps them to develop a good plan for their personal business model. Other questions or comments? <coughs> Very good. Chair Davids, your closing comments on uh, House File 3052. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, for uh, uh, hearing uh, our witnesses. Uh, House File 3052 is a fine piece of legislation. I appreciate your support. Smoking hot. Smoking hot. Thank you all. Uh, so with that, House File 3052 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, uh, <coughs> Representative Nash. Members, this is uh, an informational thing. I've been uh, in close contact with uh, Representative Nash on an issue that's very, very personal to him. We had some testimony a few weeks ago, I think, that was uh, fairly emotional. I think we may experience some of the th same things today. But I know how near and dear this is to your heart, Representative Nash, and uh, welcome to the committee. And um, Proceed, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, committee. Um, yes, today will be hard. Um, this is my friend Tom Schooley. I've known Tom since 2003. Um, hunted and fished with he and his son Sam. And we're here today to talk about um, carbon monoxide in fish houses and the need for uh, more education. Um, so I will let Tom do the majority of the sharing, but just know that uh, we in the legislature have the opportunity to drive education on the dangers of carbon monoxide in fish houses. And I just wanted to say that I had a bill, um, but I want to thank the DNR, wherever you guys are. There you are. I want to thank them for their willingness to work with us um, so that we don't have to always do a bill. And I appreciate their willingness to do that. But um, I will let my friend Tom Schooley do, uh, we'll share a little bit, but uh, uh, it, it'll be hard. So, Tom. Get Good morning, yourself. Mr. Schooley. Uh, let me start out by saying our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers go out to you. I'm Thank sure you. that I appreciate being it. a father myself, I can't imagine what you and your wife must be going through. Um, very, very difficult time, and I want you to know that um, we take this situation very seriously here, and I'm looking forward to what you have to say. So thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. I appreciate here. it. Uh, 47 days ago, my son died from carbon monoxide poisoning while sleeping in a fish house. Uh, he was 21 years old. I have a letter from his mom that she wants me to share. Uh, I am grateful you are trying to help educate fellow fishermen of the danger of carbon monoxide. It saddens my heart to the core that I lost my son to a tragic accident that could have potentially been prevented if there were laws, requirements, standards that could have been in place uh, that could have saved Sam's life. Sam loved the outdoors from a little kid on. Sam's dad, Tom, taught and educated Sam to be a safe outdoorsman. Sam loved to hunt, fish, ice fish, dirt bike, snowmobile. He loved everything outdoors. Sam died uh, ice fishing on Leech Lake, and I appreciate the time he took, the time to look at the need to educate fishermen, both young and old, on the safety measures needed in place to prevent other families to have to endure what we are. To raise the fisherman and a the hunter, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things I had to teach Sam. Um, and a, a lot of people that bring people into um, the outdoors, uh, introduce them to hunting and fishing. There's a lot, of, a lot of teaching, mentoring that needs to go on. And I taught my son a lot of things in his short life. Um, however, I, <clears throat> I couldn't teach him stuff that I didn't know myself. I've been in and I've slept in a lot of fish houses. I knew very little about carbon, carbon monoxide prior to this. Um, while fishing in these fish houses, I very rarely seen carbon monoxide detectors. And uh, take it from me, most fishermen don't know the dangers of carbon monoxide. Um, when something preventable happens, like my son's death, the parents' biggest wish is that something positive could come out of it. and. Uh, this education is, is that positive thing that could come out of this. Um, fishermen don't know what they don't know, and we can't teach what we don't know to the young people that we're bringing uh, into the sport. 
So I appreciate the time and I appreciate um, the consideration of this education that we're talking about. Thank you, Mr. Schooley. Thank you. Representative Nash. Yeah. Um, thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Smith. Okay. For the record, got, yep. Colonel, Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Thank Mr. You. Chair, members, um, I did put together a short PowerPoint because I think um, pictures are going to help kind of frame this discussion a little bit more. So um, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Nash and, and um, testifier here for uh, bringing this important issue forward. Um, we have had some tragic losses over the years um, with uh, carbon monoxide in fish houses. We've also had them in hunting cabins and hunting shacks. Um, this body did, um, in the last couple of years, bring forward legislation, uh, Sophia's Law, for carbon monoxide detectors in, in uh, watercraft. And so um, there are a few lessons learned we, we had from, from that process that I'd like to talk a little bit about as we kind of move forward. So, um, So the department does do some uh, outreach when it comes to carbon monoxide. So in the fishing synopsis, which I believe you have in front of you, we do have a two-page spread that has been in there for a number of years. Um, it is back in the area where the ice houses are. Numbers on page 70 if you're looking. In page 70. Um, it does talk about the dangers of carbon monoxide. That uh, I believe we printed over a million of these uh, for the last couple of years. It is state law that everybody that buys a fish, fishing license um, is given an opportunity to get one of these synopsis books. I believe uh, this year we've, uh, we're just sending out the 2018s uh, right now to folks. We've done a number of media events over the years, um, we've partnered with the Department of Public Safety. There's a number of links for a bunch of uh, different media stories that we've done, um, including social media. Uh, we do some bunch of online messaging. So in the department webpage, we do have a banner seasonally that comes out and we do talk about um, ice safety. Um, and carbon monoxide dangers uh, when the ice fishing season does come around. Um, and then we also have some online FAQs when it comes to ice shelters. Um, there is much more that we can do. Uh, we have hired in the Division of Enforcement recently a communications coordinator who is taking our messaging to that next level. And so um, we've already worked with, uh, committed with Representative Nash and, and other stakeholder groups uh, to be a little bit more aggressive in today's media when it comes to messaging safety. And uh, this is one of these things that we'll be um, doing a better job uh, and committing a little bit more to um, for messaging in the future. What I would like to talk about a little bit is, um, and this is where you can obviously tell my PowerPoint skills. Um, we do have a variety of fish shelters here in the state. Um, and we've actually seen quite a bit of a, a turnover in the types of fish houses that we see. Uh, up about 10 years ago, we saw a lot of homemade shelters, a lot of plywood slapped together with tarps on top for a roof. And um, we're really seeing um, a change to more of a wheelhouse type configuration and portables that are uh, much bigger, better, faster, uh, to set up. So a wheelhouse, um, if you travel anywhere in northern Minnesota um, in the in the winter time, you'll probably see these being pulled behind uh, cars. And um, 
We have a number of manufacturers here in this state. Um, Ice Castle is one of them. They're one of the biggest manufacturers. Um, they, these are uh, started out as fish houses. They are now uh, RVs in the summertime. People use them multi-use <coughs> multi year round. A number of these, um, they do come with carbon monoxide detectors in them. Um, I've, in fact, I just purchased a used one here this year and the first thing I looked for was smoke alarms and the carbon monoxide de detectors in there and whatnot. So um, we're seeing a prol proliferation of these. Um, a lot of people, this actually bringing a lot of new people into the sport. We're also seeing the portable fish houses um, change a little bit. These also are heated. And these also do can create a danger when it comes to carbon monoxide. And so you can see the red one here um, is what is called more of a hub style. Even though it is portable, there are people that will sleep in these. They'll bring a cot. You can put two or three of these together sometimes, these, these big red ones, and actually sleep in them overnight on cots. And we're, we're starting to see more and more people do that. They call it ice camping. Um, and then, of course, you have the smaller flip over otter style. However, we do see still a number of these homemade fish houses. Um, you can see on the left, uh, or the white one there, um, a homemade version of a, of a fish house. And then on the right, you can also see something that somebody uh, homemade, and you can see the stovepipe coming up the back end of that. Um, that homemade one. We also see uh, people that are selling kits where they'll just sell a frame and then a person may come and make their own. And uh, people at Ice Fish are rather ingenious, I guess you could say. They will make something out of anything. This here is a frame that was purchased and then a person just made a canvas side um, fish house. And so it's actually not a strong sided structure, it's actually canvas. Um, so you can see a lot of different things. And then you see where people will convert um, RVs into fish houses and they're multi-use as well. Um, they'll use them for hunting and they'll use them for camping. So looking ahead, I think what we'd wanna do um, in talking with Representative Nash is obviously we wanna increase our education and outreach efforts about the dangers of carbon monoxide. And I think we had some lessons learned with Sophia's law. Um, we would like to, before we move forward with Representative Nash and others that may be interested in writing some type of legislation, we want to clearly identify and solicit input from industry and stakeholders um, over this interim period. Uh, we do have, like I said, manufacturers here in this state that are manufacturing fish houses and putting de uh, detectors in there. We want to make sure that um, anything that we that this legislature would do would be consistent with what they're doing, some of their best practices. Um, we want to clearly identify which structures would need some type of detector, as you can see with that short pictorial, that um, not all fish houses are created equal. And um, we want to like, make sure that we understand and clearly have a path forward um, on, on what would need to be, um, what types of structures would need to have some type of detector. And then we also want to, um, one of the lessons learned we had with Sophia's Law is clearly identify the appropriate detector and the manufacturer. And so um, those are some of those steps forward. So we're committed as a department to work with stakeholders, industry, um, Representative Nash and others um, to uh, come forward here next year, hopefully, and um, have a little better understanding of what this universe looks like. And with that, Mr. Chair, I can stand for questions. Thank you. Um, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just thank you for bringing this forward. I did have a question uh, for uh, Lieutenant. Um, so I've uh, one of my uncles has one of those fancier fish houses, and I know when I've been in there and when I've been in other fish houses, you know, you sometimes you walk in there and you know, 
often with smoke detectors and other detectors, you know, you see it and it's hanging open and somebody's taken the battery out because it was annoying or they just didn't feel like putting the battery in. And so I'm wondering, you know, when you're doing other enforcement, when officers are out there checking licenses and checking other things, are they also looking for that? Are they commenting on that? Are they doing education about uh, carbon monoxide at the same time that they're doing other enforcement activities? Colonel. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative. Currently, there is no state law to require them to be in there. So we do have officers that will make those comments. But um, we, like I said, we can do a better job in the outreach and education as well. And I believe if we do have some standards in place, it'll be much more comfortable for our officers to be able to, to address those types of things. Representative becker uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would encourage, you know, to continue that work because I think that's that's important. You know, sometimes the th sometimes the thing that motivates people to make sure they got their license on them is because they're, you know, they know that the officers are out there. I know I've I've run into more enforcement officers ice fishing than any of the other types of outdoor um, activities that I do, and so I think that's really a missed opportunity to not do that education. And if there's something we can do to change the law to make that. Uh, work better so that we're getting that message across in a way that people are hearing it, then I, I think that's really important. And Representative Nash, let, let me know. I'd be happy to work with you on this. I've, I've fished on Leech Lake. I remember hearing the story and wondering if that was one of my cousins because I've, you know, there it, it could have been anybody's family member and we really do need to do more about um, this issue and bringing it to the public's attention. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Spooley, my heart goes out to you. Uh, uh, Colonel, are you looking at doing some of the stickers and stuff on the, for the manufactured homes like has like, uh, been a result of the Sophia's Law thing? And, and I appreciate the direction that the DNR is taking on this one and to, to uh, move it along in an ed educational uh, manner. Colonel. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Eklund. So just some of the ideas I've had, well, a lot of these wheelhouses, um, they come with all kinds of stickers all over them. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think when we talk with industry, we also have um, here in Minnesota some of the soft-sided fish houses like clam um, and others. And it would be interesting to have discussions with them to see what they do with their manufacturing. I see that they do have venting in a lot of their structures, but it would be interesting to have those conversations with them. Have they thought about the, you know, CO issues and whatnot and so um, I think that's why we want to engage those that industry is to see what they're already doing um, to see um, how we can capitalize on that and, and have those discussions and maybe have to have those stickers and, and whatnot so um, those that's all things that I think that we'll be working through here uh, in the interim thank you representative Eklund well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I own three different styles of those hub type things. I haven't moved to a ice castle yet, but maybe someday. But uh, so I would think that uh, with all the markings that they put on those things anyway, that that could be incorporated into the into the manufacturing process. And then uh, Representative Nash, I too would be uh, set, uh, certainly willing to work with you on future legislation on this because I think it's uh, definitely something that's needed. Members, others. Just, uh, just help, sure. yeah, Representative Ublum. Yeah, just quickly, um, I'm lucky enough to own an ice castle. <laughs> um, hasn't improved my fishing any, but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I think the manufacturers, whoever they might happen to be, whether it be Ice Castle or any of the others in the state, for liability purposes, yeah, mine's got stickers all over it. But they are battery powered ones, uh, although, you know, you can run a generator and obviously. Uh, uh, do AC, but but um, the manufactured houses I think do a pretty good job right now, and of course it's up to us to keep the batteries in the uh, in the CO2 detectors. But but some of the issues with the other ones uh, I think are very real, and it would be good if we could do something. Good point. Um, just a couple of things as I'm looking through the uh, the book for this year, just a, suggestions. Um, you know, the, the two pages that are on page 70 and 71, um, I think that it's good information, but needs a little more splash and dash to it from my perspective. And then maybe in the uh, table of contents at the beginning, uh, possibly something there 
where this is located in the book, you've got some things highlighted and other things in smaller print. Maybe that carbon uh, CO uh, information could be there in red or something like that to direct people's eyes to that because it is important. I mean, regulations are important in terms of how many fish you can have and where you can fish and when the season starts and all that, but this is something that's a little bit different. So um, those are my perspectives and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more de uh, conversation on this. Uh, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate the willingness of my colleagues to, to help educate so that what happened to, to Sam doesn't happen to others. Um, you know, we also have talked to the DNR about uh, <coughs> promoting a video that we will have produced uh, professionally so that we can talk about Sam, his love of the outdoors, um, and ways that we can prevent this from happening to other families. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I've known the Schooley family for a lot of years and just share in their overwhelming grief uh, because everyone loved Sam, so. Well, Mr. Schooley, you talked about raising your son and, and I've raised three and I can tell you that my sons would fit into your family and your son would have fit very well into my family. So, members, I would also encourage you, I know a number of us do weekly updates I'm doing one that will come out tomorrow. House Photography is here. Thank you for being here. I think it would be uh, helpful if we can start this uh, campaign by putting something in this week's uh, update uh, and maybe some references to what we did here today and to Sam and to the Schooley family and carbon monoxide safety. And not just in fish houses, but I mean, we have uh, LP heaters and, and my deer stands and, and uh, other places. So this is an important topic. So. Mr. Schooley, any closing comments from you, sir? No, I just, uh, I just really appreciate the potential to have more education because it's just a tragic, it's a tragic thing to have happen, and um, I think education is definitely uh, the most important thing that we can do. Uh, one other thing, uh, Colonel Smith, the placement of a CO detector, you know. In regards to, you know, smoke detectors go up, but I think carbon monoxide, if I remember my science and so forth, is heavier, should be located closer to the floor. Am I correct on that? That's what we do in my cabin where we have an LP heater out uh, north of Grigola. Mr. Chair, I believe you're correct. Yep. Closing comments. Again, thank you, members. Mr. Chair, um, we appreciate the time. Appreciate you're sympathetic here and uh, would love to have as many of you work alongside of us as possible. Um, <coughs> if you drive in northern Minnesota or anywhere in Minnesota this time of year, uh, it's a small village of people out ice fishing. I think we are the state of ice fishing, so um, we have a, a unique opportunity to uh, help drive education. Thank you. Well, well said. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have uh, House File 4243. <coughs> <coughs> Representative, I'm going to move your bill 4243 to be laid over for possible inclusion. And then I see you have a DE4 in uh, your packet. I'll go ahead and move the DE4. If you could just briefly describe or uh, go through some of what's going on in the amendment. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, members and Mr. Chair. My DE4 just puts the bill in the shape um, that I think it needs to be in after working with uh, the five different stakeholder groups. And this is what, this is basically our Peace in the Valley bill. So with that, uh, the DE4 has been moved. All those in favor of the DE4 is presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Those, oops, I'm sorry. Those opposed? The, the amendment is adopted. To the, amend to the bill as adopted. Members, we're working off the DE4. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Good morning. Uh, House File 4243 concerns the Hill Annex Mine State Park in Marble, which is located just outside of Calumet. The park was created on the site of the Hill Annex Mine 
which when it closed in 1978 was the sixth largest in the state, producing 62 million tons. In 1986, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places and was designated as a state park in 1988. In recent years, the DNR has identified sustainability issues and indicated a preference to close this park by 2019. Last year, the Environment Omnibus Bill included a provision to keep the park open, but in doing so also created a working group of the DNR, the IRRRB, the Western Mine, uh, Masaba Mine Planning Board, the City of Calumet, and Itasca County to develop an operating, an alternate operating model for the park going forward. Last year's bill gave the working group a deadline of January 15th of this year to submit a plan. While the group held four public meetings and developed a report, it was determined a more comprehensive plan and feasibility study would be needed. This bill in front of you today would set a deadline of June 30th, 2021 for this management and operation plan to be developed. It also appropriates $150,000 of a one-time appropriation to Itasca County to develop local partnerships, perhaps a joint powers agreement or something similar to that, to create and implement a plan for a viable future for the, state, for the park. The folks in our region have worked extremely hard to come up with a solution that preserves the park. It has great educational, historical, cultural, and scientific values and resources that are all worth protecting. Uh, the park's geological landscape provides one of the best places to find fossils anywhere in the country and attracts a great number of fossil hunters. As I said earlier, I've worked very hard with the stakeholders in the DNR to arrive at Peace in the Valley. And I have County Commissioner Ben DiNucci with me today to tell you just a little bit more about the park. Mr. DiNucci, welcome. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee <coughs> members. My name is Ben DiNucci. I'm a county commissioner for Itasca County, home of the Hill Annex Mine State Park in Calumet, Minnesota. I'm here today to speak in support of the bill concerning the future of the Hill Annex Mine State Park. The Hill Annex Mine is a former major open pit natural iron ore mine and processing plant, the last of many of its type that still remains. The Hill Annex Mine is the only open pit mine that, when it closed, the mining company left everything intact. Visitors to the park gain an understanding of what iron mining was all about here by walking through the 1930s clubhouse, viewing old mining equipment, buildings, mining overlooks, and overburden. It is a, compan it is a companion to the Tower Sedan Underground State Park in Sedan, Minnesota, which gives tours of the underground mine. State parks such as these preserve the importance of the iron mining industry to our state and our country. Hill Annex is so unique in that it is a great place for people to find 86 million year old fossils from the massive inland sea that once covered the area. Guests are turned into archeologists as they hunt for shark's teeth or coral to take home with them. Students can be brought into the park and shown history right under their feet. Last year, Representative Lehman and Representative Sandsteed obtained resources to start the process of finding a different method of management, possible enhancements to create more revenue and, vi and visitor interest, and other options for the park area. During 2017, a strong joint group comprised of representatives from the DNR, IRRR, the Joint Powers Group Western Masabi Mine Planning Board, Itasca County, and the City of Calumet met several times to develop for consideration an alternate concept model for the park, which was submitted to legislative leaders by the DNR Commissioner on January 16, 2018. Because of the unique aspects and the situation of this park, the local groups feel strongly that the future of the park would benefit from further study and improvements, during which time the park should continue to be operated by the DNR. The study will address the final options available to change ownership, management, or other aspects of determining the future of the facility. During this time of further study, the local, commu the local community is willing to take steps to assist in park operation with community volunteers. 
this year's request is to take the next step in finalizing options. So thank you for the op opportunity to testify before the community today. Thank you. Um, questions for these two testifiers? We have uh, Mr. Leversedge come down. If you're ready for that, Representative Sandsteed. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> director, welcome. Deputy Director. Um, well, you good got morning. Promotion. Good morning, Mr. You Chair. You got a promotion. And, and members. <laughs> Proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Um, as, as Representative Sandsteed um, summarized, we have been working with the local planning groups um, first to produce the report that was um, directed from last year's legislative session and then also to try to start working on the, the model for um, transitioning to a local management. Um, we, we've been working with this current bill and support this and believe that this bill helps move um, the project forward. The, the division, um, as Representative Sandsteed pointed out, recognized um, as part of our system planning process that the sustainability of Hill Annex Mine as a state park in the long term is, is difficult for us. It's, it's a high cost operation with relatively low use. Um, last year we had about less than 2,000 tours in the park brought in about $15,000 and it cost the state over $120,000 a year to operate. We believe it's a, a great local asset, however, and that's why we've been interested in working with the local groups to try to come up with a local model for operating the park going forward. Um, Hill, Annex, Hill Annex Mine State Park does sit on school trust fund lands um, and it is leased from the school trust. and it also has in the enabling legislation um, a stipulation that when mining is eventually um, feasible again on the site and there is there are millions of dollars of mineral resources left on that site that eventually it will likely go back to being an active mine operation or potentially go back to active mine operation. Um, the enabling legislation and the plan is that there would be an interim operation of, of the park as a historic park until such time as, as mining is feasible again. Um, we believe the local model is, is the best model and we're very willing to work with the county and the local planning groups to help make that happen. Thank you. Representative Waginius. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> You all caught my attention when you said you could find shark's teeth there. <laughs> uh, I didn't know you could do that in Minnesota. I thought you had to we go can't to hear you, Representative hmm? uh, My attention was caught oh. uh, by the mention that you could find shark's teeth there. I didn't think you could do that uh, in Minnesota. I thought you had to go to the East Coast to do that. So what I hear here is both a historic site and an environmental learning center. And we have done a lot in Minnesota to help develop environmental learning centers. And here you have an environmental learning center without, um, you, you don't have to develop it, you have it. It feels like there isn't the, haven't developed the way to attract students to it. Has anybody um, talked about this as an environmental learning center? To the testifiers, Mr. Leversedge. Mr. Chair. Deputy Director. Mr. Chair, Representative Wiginius, I don't believe the, um, the concept of an environmental learning center has been discussed, but it may be part of what the planning group will look at. Representative Wiginius. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Solberg, yep, come on down. The price is right. Uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, Lauren Solberg, I'm a lobbyist and I represent Itasca County, which is part of the Western Masabi Mine Planning Board. 
Uh, there is a, a marketing tool that has been used by uh, two organizations uh, working together, three organizations working together. The uh, Minnesota Forest History Center, uh, the uh, Judy Garland's Children's Center, uh, uh, Children's Museum, and the Hill Annex Mine uh, have put together over the years an opportunity for school children to be able to come and, and tour those. Part of the problem, however, is that when you have three groups in the school days and children are getting out of school, there's probably not the opportunity to get visit all three of those during one trip. They'll usually probably do two of them. And the ones that are probably the heavily used is the Children's Museum, Judy Garden Children's Museum in Grand Rapids and the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids. And they can sometimes combine those into one group. But I think your idea of being able to market the Hill Annex as a children's opportunity has a, a great deal of of opportunities, I think, in in that I'm doing some of the marketing for that place. Representative Lagenius. Well, we have some very robust environmental learning centers in Minnesota, and I think perhaps visiting with those folks and seeing how they do uh, mm -hmm. their learning centers because they're very popular, and we've we've certainly put a lot of money, like LCCMR money into those centers. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Silver. Representative Guinness, as, as the creator of the park, uh, I understand that it's an extremely important uh, geological center uh, and unique in it's, that it's the only existing one that it has the old um, machinery and the old buildings still standing. Uh, the difficulty, of course, with the expense is trying to prevent the water from rising and taking, once it gets into the overburden instead of the, the bedrock, uh, you lose all the buildings. But uh, the, the learning center that would be closest to be able to coordinate that is about uh, 80 miles away. It's, it's Long Lake uh, Environmental Learning Center uh, by Palisades. But I think uh, I'll sure have some conversations with them. I stopped there every once in a while. Uh, I was part of the creation of those as well. Thank you. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few questions for uh, Deputy Director. Um, I wasn't writing quite fast enough, but how many visitors a year uh, to this park? Mr. Chair, Representative Green, um, in 2017, we had 1,770 tour visits. Um, and then with the clubhouse, um, we figured that there were maybe another eight to nine hundred visits that were just clubhouse visits, so maybe twenty five hundred total visits. Of that, Mr. Chair, about six hundred visits are school children visits, um, organized school groups. Representative Green. And and if I heard you thank you, Mr. Chair, and if I heard you right, you're losing about a hundred and five thousand dollars a year on the park? Deputy Director Leverstitch. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Representative Green, um, that that's correct. The the um, revenue for Hill Annex Mine is about $15,000, primarily tour revenue, um, because the park does not charge um, entrance fees because of the nature of how it's located. All the parking is outside of the, the park boundary, um, and the operating expenses are, are approximately $120,000. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, will, if, if let, let's say we continue to put the, the money into the park and lose money every year, Will the fact that it, the park is intact affect the ability to mine this uh, when, uh, when it becomes, uh, uh, when the opportunity arises? Director Leverstage. Mr. Chair, Representative Green, as I understand the legislation when the park was established, mining will trump the park operation at, at the time that mining becomes um, feasible and, and that there are actual active mining activities going on. It is possible that a portion of the of the site, the clubhouse, which is kind of isolated from the active mining and, and spoil piles, could continue to be operated as a as a site itself. Representative Green, Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, did uh, have you been in contact with the school trust director on this? Director Leverson. Mr. Chair, Representative Green, we we are working with the school trust director, and we do actively. Um, 
lease that land, the park land from the school trust currently. We, we lease the acreage for about $9,000 per year, and that's part of the operating cost. Just, just, just a couple more. Uh, can you tell me how many state parks are in uh, Minnesota right now? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Representative Green, I believe the number of state parks and recreation areas is 76. Representative Green. Can you tell me uh, on all 76 parks, what is the total profit the state has per year? Director Leversedge. Mr. Chair, Representative Green, state parks are not established to generate a profit and we do not have a total profit. Representative Green. Oh, so uh, I didn't ask you if, you if you were established to make a profit. I'm asking you how much uh, the, pro the parks made. So how much was the loss from the parks? Director Leversedge. Mr. Chair, Representative Green, I can provide that information. I believe we provided that report last year to the legislature and we can do that so again. I don't have that number off the top of my head. I would be curious, and we've asked this question before with the, the new park entry fee rates and so forth, to be interested to know that and visitors. Rick, uh, Representative. Just, just one last comment, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, if, if the numbers have not changed from last year, I think we have a total of about $3 million that we lose every year on our parks. So um, I think that this, we need to really look into uh, where we're putting the money and look into the parks that are making money. Uh, if we really need uh, uh, 76 parks for 87 counties when we also have a lot of county, uh, county run parks as well. Thank you. Uh, questions, uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not so much a, um, a question, but a comment. Uh, one of the things that's unique about uh, all of Northeast Minnesota uh, is the geology. Uh, and uh, I realize there can be this uh, tension between sending young folks up uh, uh, to look at geology and, uh, and mining and those types of things from an educational standpoint. Uh, and I'll opine that uh, we, we could have, or at one time had, uh, uh, the nucleus of some of the best and brightest and still have uh, mining engineers that are world class. Uh, but you'll note that uh, very few people come to the Minnesota for an educational standpoint to learn about mining. Uh, but we do have a, uh, we've got a jewel here uh, that we continue not to polish uh, that provides the opportunity to look at the geological history uh, of the state and the uniqueness of uh, uh, that entire part of the state, it, and it's it's there. You can literally walk there uh, and and pick the pieces up. Uh, uh, so uh, the learning center uh, concept, uh, as far as I can see, really is even bigger than bringing the school children uh, there. Uh, there's some things from. Uh, uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to do specifically with mining, but the, the ability to go back and literally look and pick up uh, fossils, uh, uh, that uh, would just absolutely not be possible uh, uh, unless you wanted to bore three, four, five hundred feet down and the average, uh, you know, <laughs> graduate students not got that kind of money. Uh, so, you know, I would hope there's a realization that that learning center mm -hmm. is way bigger uh, opportunity than maybe we, we realize and, and uh, we, we try to leverage that. Uh, it's disappointing that um, we don't see the kind of attendance. Uh, part of that, I'll be quite blunt with you, comes from a, uh, a perception that uh, mining is ugly, dirty, terrible thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion, but that has a price that the communities pay uh, when uh, you, you do uh, paint that kind of picture. Uh, and it's, a, it's an incorrect picture. Uh, but again, I, I think there's a great opportunity here, uh, Representative Sands said, to make sure we stand back and look at this as, as it's way bigger than just uh, going back and looking at, at, at how we did mine uh, in that particular area, there's a, there's a lot more opportunity. So I wish you luck and give you a hand on wherever we can uh, help. I've got a little project that I'll watch uh, Assistant Commissioner's head pop up and say we've got something called the Croft Mine uh, uh, Museum that sits down uh, 
uh, in Crosby that uh, uh, we are continuing to work as to whether that uh, belongs to the Department of Natural Resources right now, whether that what is the best future for that? But again, that's an opportunity for people to walk in and look at the entire history. Uh, but there's another side of that, and that goes to the geology and, and archaeology, all kinds of things that uh, we don't we kind of take for granted uh, in our part of the world. Uh, so anyway, good luck, and I would hope we can continue to change that. Uh, <coughs> perception that is out there in a few places that, oh my gosh, you don't want to go look at that. It's just a big mess and a lot of piles of rocks because those rocks are actually interesting to some folks. Interesting rocks. Uh, <laughs> Representative Sensen, I appreciate the uh, treats that you brought. I'm surprised, though, that you didn't have like a shark's tooth or something there, Mr. Nanucci. I would have thought that you, know, you had a little jewelry or a lapel pin or something, but uh, next we have Representative Johnson. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Leversedge. Uh, and we're uh, not going to put any bison in this park either. No, though. no, but okay. the bison are, by the way, the bison at Minneopolis State Park are remarkably popular. And that's outside of Mankato. Come on down, enjoy them, and spend some time in a fine city. Oh, oh no, my question is. Just, my, think, um, just think a thousand years from now, they'll be mining uh, buffalo bones, bison bones out of that area. Well, eventually there will be. Uh, but my question is is related to just the, the trend lines in the state parks and the use and that sort of thing. Could you share just the, what is the trend line? Are we seeing more or less people using state parks? and? Uh, any comments about uh, their general level uh, public satisfaction with their experience in the state parks? Deputy Director Leversedge. Sure. Mr. Chair, Representative Johnson and members, um, our overall attendance and, and revenue continues to rise. Um, the pace is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent per year. With the addition of our 100 percent reservations, um, allowing all of our campsites to be reserved in advance a couple of years ago, our camping um, attendance just continues to rise consistently. Um, we had this conversation earlier this year. In spite of our, our higher um, permit entry fees, our annual and daily permit sales continue to rise. Um, and I think people generally, we, we just completed a visitor survey last year in 2017 and satisfaction rates continue to be at very high levels, 90% 90, 90 plus of very satisfied customers. I know one park would have more visitors if we had ATVs allowed in it. Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to say that, you know, uh, just a comment that this, the, the state parks are real assets to the community. You can see from my comments about Minneopolis State Park that that's a really important uh, part of my community. And I know they are wherever there's a state park. That's a remarkably strong asset. And, w and this transition where, it, where there is a transitionary time uh, to, to transition out from a state park. That's a difficult decision. It's hard in that community. And I just want to commend, commend all of you for working together and uh, Representative Sandsteed for carrying this bill for, to make that transition work because it's, it's more than the park. It's also the <coughs> larger community and that asset needs to be preserved. So my, my compliments on your working together to make sure this works well. Uh, to your point, uh, Representative Johnson, I would say that I've been encouraging those conversations at the local level for a, a number of years now. And uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess my comments are more on the comments uh, uh, on the bill rather than the bill. But uh, Representative Lewick, I, I think I was agreeing with you most of the time there uh, until you got to the part about people don't want to go look at rocks. And I actually think that people do. Uh, I think He's, that. I think that's what he said. Uh, I think that people. And I, I don't think that um, there's a down, I don't think that people aren't going to this mine because of mining. I think they're going to the mine. They're going to the mine because of mining because they think that this is a part of history and they're curious and uh, they're going to look for that shark's tooth now. Uh, I know my son will. Um, so I, I think we we want to make sure we're we're trying to uh, not make assumptions about. Some of this stuff, and um, but I was unclear on what Representative Green was saying uh, about like number of parks per county, or uh, that I, I'm I'm, un, I'm unclear on what you were referring there to. Because I think that in general, um, and I think that's what the DNR was testifying to, is that 
uh, park attendance keeps going up. We have an increasingly uh, increasing population in the state. People love the parks, uh, and they just don't love them all equally. Uh, and so there, there are some that have extremely high use and some that have uh, lesser use. But I think that people are willing to fund the parks, probably more than we have funded the parks. And uh, our state is changing, and I think that often uh, the Department of Natural Resources focuses on the wildlife side, particularly the hunting side, when we even heard today on the, on the angling, and with the angling tra tragedy of just the change that's happened in a few years and what people are purchasing in terms of the fish houses and how something has transformed in a relatively short period of time. And I think our state is transforming uh, over a relatively short period of time. And with that transformation, people are going to be willing to financially support the parks if they can see the improvements. And that is going to make, be involved making some of the tough choices uh, about the type of, of protection that they have. Uh, so I, I'm hope, hopeful, Mr. Chair, that there's not, uh, and I know that uh, uh, during uh, your chairship that uh, there's been support for the parks. I think there could be more. I mean, I think that, again, Minnesotans will continue to surpri surprise and provide uh, for their state parks and trails. Thank you. Representative becker -Pin. I, You're on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess to, to go off of what Representative Hansen was just talking about, you know, he said they just don't love all the parks equally, but I think they, we don't know about all the parks equally. And I certainly would have already brought my children to go look for fossils and learn about mining if I had known it was there. We, we, we go stay at a friend's cabin in Ely uh, every summer and have visited things closer to there, the Wolf Center, the Bear Center, you know, gone fishing, uh, the Boundary Waters. But I, I didn't know you could go look for shark's teeth. So, you know, maybe it's also um, Explore Minnesota and some of the other, um, you know, agencies and operations that we already have out there could be doing a better job. Um, because I certainly didn't know that and that sounds really cool and now I'm adding that to my my schedule for this this summer uh, with with my kids um, and so you know obviously that's that's a really um, great asset for everybody in our state to be able to do that without going to the the coasts and the ocean and um, so related to that you know there's been a lot of men mention of other other resources so do we know what these other minerals or resources are that we've been referencing that are located there? Director Leversedge. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Becker-Finn, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. The, the, as, far as, as far as exploring geology and so on, or what minerals? Well, there, Representative becker there, There's been references to, you know, you might want to be uh, mining or going after some other kind of resource that's located at the site. What are those resources that, you know, it sounds like the, the iron is, is taken, you know, we're, we're done with that piece. What are the other? Uh, Director Oliver said, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Becker Finn, the resource that is still there is the taconite resource. It's um, technology is advancing and the ability to recover, um, Iron from the spoils piles is is part of what the future potential is there. Um, so it is it is the iron iron ore resource that is still there. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I think that's important because obviously there is different demand and there are different consequences and um, you know different environmental impacts depending upon what it is that that we're mining. So it's really helpful to know that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Hornstein. I'm looking forward to your. Uh, this comments and not questions. Earth, not earth shattering, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. I, I also want to uh, thank, uh, <laughs> no, th thank uh, everybody involved in this. This is, uh, uh, I think, a fantastic effort. And along the same lines as uh, Representative Becker Finn, uh, I didn't know about it. It seems fascinating. It seems worth a visit. I'm wondering, um, maybe uh, Mr. Leversedge uh, would have information on this. Do you track where uh, visitors are coming from? 
Uh, and I, I hope we get more folks from the cities in the metro area to, to visit a, a treasure like this. Mr. Director Leversedge. Mr. Chair, um, Representative Ordenstein, we, we only track really our camping attendance. That's where we get name and address information. We do not track our permit sales. Um, anecdotally, we do know that, that a lot of our attendance um, generally comes from the Twin Cities metro area, obviously, where, where the greatest population in the state is. But many of our parks are, are very attractive in their regional settings as well, and people from all over Minnesota travel to see their spectacular parks and trails all over the state. So I would say that, that the attendance um, at, at all of our parks in general comes from all over the state, as well as from out-of-state residents and international residents. Um, the, the actual attendance at Hill Annex Mine State Park, the local school groups, the school groups are primarily local that are doing the tours, you know, from within a 50 to 75 mile radius for easy travel. Um, but the, the visitors to the park probably represent the state population and um, it really is just about knowledge and opportunity. Um, if you're traveling up Highway 169 and you drive through the City of Calumet, you'll see the state park signs. That's the way some people find their way to it. Others, people are who are interested in mining history or, or geologic history. I know the University of Minnesota conducts geologic tours um, at, at Hill Annex Mine. So, um, those are some of the sources of of the visitation. Thanks, Mr. Representative Hornstein. Thanks. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, Representative Wagenius. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on Representative Green's comment, and I'm, I'm not sure I heard it correctly, uh, that we're looking at um, a loss when a profit at the parks at $3 million a year. Is that what I heard? Mr. Uh, Director, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Wigenius, I, I will provide that report to to the legislature uh, once again, and we'll we'll update it for this year as well. Um, I do know that we have a net operating loss. I'm, that's that's a given. It's an investment in my mind. It's an investment that all Minnesotans make in protecting the spectacular places for future generations. So to me, it's it's not a loss. It's an investment. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that as part of our visitor survey, we do also um, collect information on the economic impact our, our state parks and trails have on local communities. And the average visitor to the state park spends about 25, between 25 and $30 per person per day outside of the park in local communities. If you multiply that by our 10 million park visitors, that's a pretty huge local economic impact across Minnesota. If I could follow up. Representative Wagin, yes. Mr. Chair, I would agree with you about both the investment and the economic impact. But even if you were to characterize this as a loss of $3 million, we have, what, 6 million people in Minnesota. So do you think Minnesotans would like to invest 50 cents a piece uh, to have a robust park system? I would think yes. Thank you. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, a comment about um, uh, Shark's teeth? whether <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> about, about the, the long-term uh, uh, future of iron mining in Minnesota. Um, the, uh, obviously, the, the southern range, the Cuyuna, um, uh, the, the standard there for the ore that went off the Cuyuna was uh, it, it had to be uh, roughly 65 percent iron content. Very specific. What they did there, they actually had iron ore that was too rich. They'd have to lean it. So we go through that process. That At some point that became une uneconomical because we, we didn't have enough rich ore and lean ore uh, to, to make that work. Um, particularly on the Masabi, uh, and that's, that's the way the system worked for a long, long time. So then along come the taconite plants, which, which concentrated that and, and made a much higher uh, 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 value product because it was a little more consistent and much higher content of iron. 
What we have left on all the ranges is a huge, huge uh, amount of, of uh, overburden that contains iron content, and it may range from a couple of percent to 15, 20, 25 percent that looked as waste. Now, we've got a uh, plant uh, uh, that's working up and down, and it's a new technology having some difficulty called magnetation that goes in and does what we call scram mining, which goes to those old stockpiles and will reprocess them and, and have found ways to pull uh, that iron out. Uh, so we'll go back to the comment in the school trust lands and why the school trust lands are important and why uh, we're not ready to give those up because uh, uh, there's still a huge amount of iron content sitting there that belongs to the K-12 education system, not to the DNR. It, 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 it's very specific uh, why those lands exist. So uh, it's important that we think long term on this and we could see areas where we may go back and, and reprocess uh, particularly some of those tailing piles. Uh, but uh, no, I, it, 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 I grew up in it. Uh, my family goes all the way back to the first mines uh, in, uh, on the Cuyuna Range. Uh, so there's a, just a fascinating history aspect there of how we uh, got to where we're at today. And, and we've actually gone further. We're going to, there'll be some more uh, uh, valuable pellets eventually created on the, on the range that'll uh, make things even more efficient with the next generation of plants. But it, it's very important that this is a way over 100 year uh, piece of Minnesota's history. Uh, and it continues to evolve. And I suspect that uh, we'll probably be, we got enough uh, mineral there that we'll probably be, somebody will be having this discussion 50 or 100 years from now. Uh, and we'll maybe we'll, we'll be chasing the last elements of the iron unless we figure out how not to use iron and steel anymore. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Sensteed, uh, closing comments on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to invite all of you up to the Hill Annex Mine this summer. I think this would also be a great thing for your weekly updates. Feel free to add that to your list. And um, I would like to uh, thank you for hearing the bill, and I'd appreciate your support as we move forward. Thank you. With that, uh, House File 4243 is laid over for possible inclusion. Anything else for the benefit of the group? Uh, keep an eye on your email. We'll have an uh, update on what's going on next week. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.